you know, I promised uh, Dr. Chapman I would uh, just tell the truth and nothing but the truth. So being from New York, I brought uh, Judge Judy there. Um, but it's kind of interesting. No implant has been disrespected as much as lumbar arthroplasty, despite the fact that it has so much more overwhelming evidence than uh, any other implant we put in the body, whether it's a total hip or a total knee or uh, a plate or a screw or a rod or a hook. And nobody has accumulated the, the prospect of randomized um, hard scientific evidence that, that lumbar disc replacement has. Um, and these are comments that I get all the time uh, from smart people um, at, you know, at big, big time meetings. It doesn't work, there's no data, you know, they all fail, uh, lots of reoperations, high morbidity, patients are gonna die, you know, there's all, all kinds of stuff. And at the beginning, um, sort of had no defense for that. We just said, hey, we're starting all these big prospective studies, well, we'll find out. You know, we'll just do informed consent, and do these in a, in a scientific, logical fashion. But we've got the data now, and I'll, I'll kind of show all that stuff to you. So, uh, you know, for those of you not from Texas, this is, uh, you know, the response to uh, a lot of these uh, criticisms, um, because the evidence is really strong. And just like in cervical that I showed you yesterday, it's layered, it's multi-layered. Uh, lots of different establishments, lots of different devices, lots of surgeons, lots of patients, all piled one on top of the other, and then the data is sliced. It's crisscrossed in lots of different ways. So um, we're really pretty confident that it is true data that we can um, really uh, uh, take stock in it. And, and it's generated this way. This was like during the protest study, this was the stuff that was laying on my desk all the time. Um, every week there were these case report forms and uh, you know nobody uh, fools around with the FDA It's the federal government and when they come in with an auditor. It's just like an IRS audit They're paid to find something wrong, you know Whether it's a missing signature or an illegible date or a number that doesn't match you are responsible man And you know every one of those yellow tags I had to sign for so I was the responsible party And if they come in and they just think you screwed up you get like a little slap on the wrist But if they come in and they suspect fraud um, you can go to jail. There are stiff penalties, and it's the principal investigator at the site. You can go to jail, you lose your license, you lose the ability to, um, to take care of Medicare patients for the rest of your life or any federal patients. You get posted on, on websites. So there are some pretty stiff penalties for screwing up this stuff, which is why you know these FDA study numbers, um, it's in nobody's interest to falsify them or do anything that can't be cross-checked. So we all get it that the future spine surgery is going to depend on data, and, and these studies generated, this is week after week after week, you know, I would tell them, just put them on my chair, because if you put them in a corner or put them on the desk, they're just going to stack up, so put them on my chair so I can't sit down until I sign off on all these things. So this was my life, um, you know, during these big, massive FDA studies. We, we were the big, uh, biggest enroller in this study, but this was going on at 17 sites all around the country just for this one study. So the data is collected in the trenches by surgeons, by your colleagues who just decided, you know, this would be something interesting to be involved in. Nobody gets paid for this. There's no extra credit. You don't, uh, you know, you don't get taken on a cruise. This is just extra work that people decided to do because we thought this could be a good thing for patients and we're gonna be participants in that effort. So the criticism that it doesn't work and there's insufficient data, um, you know, what are the clinical results now that we were able to look back on this? Really, we've got our patients, you know, 17 and 18 years out, but we've looked at them scientifically for five to 10 years um, in both, as Dr. Chapman said, fusion surgery and in different types of disc arthroplasty. These are the two disc replacements that are now um, FDA approved here in the U.S. So only three in the history of since year 2000 when this started have ever been commercially approved. The first one was the Charité disc um, uh, by uh, uh, Depew. And this was a very good disc engineering-wise. Uh, in the lab, it worked great. It had very low uh, coefficients of friction. Um, it, we all thought this was gonna be terrific. In the body, it was too slippery. It was just too finicky. Um, if you put it in a normal cadaver segment and just made a little annular window anteriorly to put it in, it performed really well. But when you put it in someone who's got a degenerated segment, well, who's already sagged and their ligaments are thickened and contracted and now you've, you're taking more out and you're releasing some, and then you put this in, and then people started to, to try these off-label and put them in multiple levels, and it's sort of like having somebody stand on a teeter board, you know, and that they can probably do that, but then put two teeter boards and, and have somebody do it. They, they gotta be really, really good. Now put three teeter boards, and you can see how tough that was. So, um, you know, I've seen immediate post-op films of multiple levels of perfectly straight spine, and then six months later, you know, one's here, one's here, one's there, which is okay. You know, you kind of realize that's what would happen with a very, very unconstrained device. So that device had some issues. It was withdrawn globally in 2011. It's no longer available. 
Um, the next one was the, the ProDisc um, L, which you saw yesterday, which was approved in 2006, still sold globally and in the US. And uh, you know, I think it's a workhorse. It's just you know, very um, simply designed uh, and seems to be performing. Nothing else came along for a long time. So for nine years, that, that was the runway. It was just those two disks and the one disk um, after Charité went away. And then in 2015, um, the Active L by Esculap, who were actually the original owners of the uh, ProDisc, um, came out with a disk that was uh, sort of halfway. It has a little bit of leeway of the polyethylene in the lower end plate. It can translate a couple of millimeters, so the center of rotation can move a little bit, like a Moby C concept, um, but with end plates that are similar to uh, ProDisc. So those are the only two that are, are FDA approved. But these other guys have, have gone through FDA studies. They've spent the 30, 40 million dollars, involved 20 sites and you know, 300 patients in each one. Uh, Maverick was uh, a Medtronics. It was a metal on metal uh, one piece disc uh, that uh, had uh, ultimately licensing issues with the keel so that Synthes um, stopped them from selling it in the US. And they were selling it outside the US for a while. I'm not sure if it's still available outside the US. The Flexicore was a metal on metal disc that had some hard stops to it. So it, it turned out that hard stops are not a good idea because if the patient over rotates, hits a hard stop, the next thing that's going to give is the bone uh, metal interface. So those discs had some issues um, and were ultimately bought by Stryker. And on the eve of at their FDA panel, Stryker withdrew the application and has never done anything else with it. So that disc um, had all the patients enrolled, reported. Uh, published, but never commercially available. Uh, Kineflex, the third one down, was a metal on metal disc, looks a little bit like a pro disc. And that was the one uh, yesterday I told you that they had a cervical study and a lumbar study both going at the same time. And both studies came to FDA panel, but the night before the FDA called and said, you better call it off, buds, because metal on metal hips are, are killing us, right? The Congress is on us. The public is on us. And there's no way this is going through. So they withdrew. That company went bankrupt, got bought by uh, an Australian um, financial, financial guy, and then Rick got resurrected as that simplified disc, the one I showed you yesterday that's in the pipeline for cervical, that's a ceramic on peak. So use the same mechanics, different materials. And the last one is the Axiomed Freedom disc. That's a uh, viscoelastic disc that is kind of been puttering around. It's still in, in FDA submission, um, but it's sort of uncertain whether that's gonna, gonna be approved. So, Data is generated in all those, but they're not commercially available. Um, the, you know, all the stuff I'll show you again is very high level uh, scientific evidence. The original paper that, that uh, my partner, Scott Blumenthal, published as a PI for the Charité study um, showed the, uh, the 304 patients that were randomized to standalone threaded fusion cages. So it just shows you one of the, the foibles of an FDA study. Um, you have to design the study, get it approved, and then perform it, which takes about five years. So in that time frame, threaded fusion cages as a uh, treatment for uh, single-level degenerative disc disease sort of disappeared. People lost confidence in it, but they were stuck with it in the middle of their study, had to pursue it and go all the way. Um, so they, they wound up with getting FDA approval, but with a control device that was no longer in popular use. A couple of years later, we were able to publish the data for the ProDisc study. They had chosen a 360 as their control, took some criticism because it was different than the single anterior approach of the ProDisc, but the flip side was it was a control that was very well established that surgeons all over the US were still doing. But of course, by the time it got approved, people were saying, you know, you didn't use BMP. Well, because BMP wasn't FDA approved when the study was designed, and you can't use that as a control. So you know it's a dynamic situation, and you're always kind of betting six or seven years ahead that you've done the right thing, you've used the right control, that there'll, there'll be a market, that you know be reimbursement. Um, it's a, it's a, a pretty significant crapshoot for, uh, for innovation. Um, but both of these studies found that arthroplasty was at least as safe and effective as fusion, as their controls, and that's why they got FDA approval. Nothing happened again until the Active L got approved um, in 2015 when the, uh, the FDA study was published in Spine. Um, Rolando Garcia was one of the designers uh, for this disc. And they also looked at large numbers of patients, large numbers of um, studies, uh, of centers rather. So a lot of surgeons, a lot of patients, and found also overall treatment success with the Active L uh, was better. They compared it to the two artificial discs that were available. Um, that were FDA approved to both Charité and ProDisc. <clears throat> so this was different study design. It was the first disc versus disc that got through the system. And it was interesting because they allowed the surgeon, once the patient randomized to the control group, 
to decide which of the two disks they wanted to use. So they had about two thirds of their controls, I think were Protus, about one third were Charité, and the two thirds of the patients who randomized to the investigational group got active L. So it's kind of an interesting study because it looks at all of the three disks um, measuring the exact same parameters out for two years and then ultimately in a five-year publication. So all of these patient populations were controlled, um, were managed for the two-year data, and then we decided let's follow them forward. Let's like really be scientists now and see what happens at five years. So they looked at the Charité patients three years later at five years, and um, Rick Geyer, one of my partners, was the lead on that paper. They ran into some IRB issues because about 40% of their sites said, we're not, we're not letting you do that. You only, we only signed up for two-year study, go away. 60% of their IRBs agreed to let them do it. So they lost some of their patients in follow-up. Um, but of the 60% of patients they were able to follow, they saw no changes in their ODI or VAS from the two-year data point to the five-year data point. Range of motion dropped by about a degree from uh, 24 months to 60 months, but you know the patients were three years older too, so we just kind of watched that. Um, and more, more of their arthroplasty patients had gone back to work than the ones who had received a fusion. So it's kind of interesting. We've got this data, now we can follow these cohorts uh, forward. Uh, the protest patient population, we were a little bit luckier. We were able to get all the IRBs to sign on uh, for an additional three-year analysis. So we were able to bring the patients back annually years three, four, and five. Um, we reported that in the Journal of Neurosurgery. So same patient cohorts, same centers, you know, uh, nothing was different. Um, and they were able to establish uh, a three-year data point, a four-year data point, a five-year data point for VAS pain improvement for both groups, 360 fusion. So we showed the value of a 360 fusion in a patient, a 42-year-old patient with disabling single-level disc disease who's failed six months, really nine months in this study, of narcotics and pain management, physical therapy, and you know whatever you could throw at them, they were up in you know with a VAS uh, way above uh, where they should have been, and they had a 60% drop that maintained now for five years. So we showed the value of surgery in an appropriately selected patient. So we kind of helped um, you know the surgical world. Um, how about ODI? Same thing. These patients were pretty impaired. They were impaired at you know above uh, sixty uh, percent, and the only thing that changed in their life was they had an operation. We followed them out for all these data points and added a three-year, four-year, five-year. So we didn't see that tail up. We don't see patients getting impaired again five years after we do the appropriate surgery on the appropriate patient. So like, good for us. You know, it's good for for people who, who gave up uh, ten years of their life in surgical training. Um, and, and this is the active L five-year preliminary data. This is submitted for publication, but it's not published yet. But again, showing um, these are the three discs. This is uh, active L, ProDisc, and Charité, um, showing huge differences from pre-op to immediately post-op improvements in their VAS and ODI that are maintained out to five years. So we're building this really solid data of, database of a lot of patients followed out for a pretty long time. And here, year three, four, and five for both. Um, there's so much data now that we were able to do a meta-analysis, elevating this from level 1B, again, to level 1A, and we just published this in the uh, Global Spine Journal just a few months ago, um, looking at four five-year level one studies and analyzing that data. And as most meta-analyses begin, you start with a word search with, you know, looking for 2,500 articles. You winnow it down, winnow it down, winnow it down, and finally get to the four that have everything that you want in it, which are um, independently randomized, prospective, followed studies with excellent follow-up. So these are the four studies that were incorporated um, in that meta-analysis. <laughs> And you know these are forest plots on meta-analyses, and what you want to see is if the diamond is over on one side or the other, it is uh, highly statistically significant. If it sort of straddles, uh, then it may be numerically but not statistically significant. So this is just patients with uh, arthroplasty were more likely to reach ODI success than if they had fusion. And you can see this one just crosses the line. So looking at all of this level one data pooled together, um, as a level 1A, you can see that, that with a, a p-value of uh, 0.05, that if a patient randomized to get a disc replacement instead of a fusion in these four studies, this was not the active L study, and they, these were all disc versus fusion studies, that they, it was more likely that they were going to reach ODI success um, highly statistically significantly. If the benefit and reduction in back pain didn't reach statistical significance, but numerically significant, favoring the, the arthroplasty patients rather than fusion, 
Huge success here in a relative reduction in the reoperation risk. So just like I showed you yesterday in cervical, the same thing holds true in lumbar. So here's this new device that moves that everybody thought was going to cause um, erupt in more reoperations than a fusion because we all know fusions are perfect. Not true. You know, fusions are good operations. We know that, but compared to our gold standard for 100 years, the arthroplasty patients were hugely, significantly better off as far as avoiding a reoperation. And in the you know looking at the analysis of all of them, the patient satisfaction, which is not an FDA success criteria in any study, the FDA does not care about patient satisfaction, but we do. Um, this is our reputation. These are our customers. Uh, this is how we make our living, and this is how we go home at night and have a happy time with our family instead of sitting in the corner. You want patients to be satisfied. They are significantly more satisfied five years down the road if they randomize to an artificial disc than if they randomize to a fusion from the exact same patient pool. So by doing this meta-analysis and pooling it, you can get to that bottom line and show that, looking at this pretty dispassionately, very objectively, that the arthroplasty patients are statistically significantly better off um, other than in back pain relief where they're only numerically better off. But at no point are they any worse off than the patients who got you know, a good fusion with, with pretty good uh, fusion rates. If we look globally, in addition to, to these um, papers, there's also observational data that's reported from outside the US with even longer term um, and generally positive. Uh, you know, it's the same kind of thing. If these were the time bombs and they were going to start exploding, you'd start seeing more and more case reports. You'd start seeing more and more series of patients with bad results. You just, we haven't seen that. We just haven't seen it or heard it from around the world. And there are plenty of people who uh, would be happy to do that because you know, they still want to throw stones at, at newer technology. It just hasn't, it hasn't happened. Um, Reoperation rates, I mean, that was the big fear, is that you'd have to go back anteriorly with high morbidity on all these patients. So we looked at that in a couple of ways. In the first 1,000 um, ProDiscale cases that were done after approval, the anterior re reoperation rate was 0.3%. So, um, you know, three patients out of 1,000 that required an anterior reoperation. If we looked at it a different way, the first 1,300 surgeons who went through formal training went back and looked at their reoperation was less than 1%. And um, we just uh, presented a TBI. We tracked our first 1,700 lumbar arthroplasty patients from the first Charité that was enrolled in the FDA study. So these were all the IDEs that we participated in. And then post-approval, all the um, lumbar artificial discs that we've done since year 2000. And we had 17 anterior reoperations in 1,700 patients, um, all of whom survived and, and did fine. Um, the nice thing about it is about two-thirds of single-level lumbar disc replacement patients are L5-S1, and as I told you yesterday in the lab, that's the safest place to go back because you can go back in the opposite retroperitoneum or you can go transperitoneal. But even the one-third who had L2, L3-4 or L4-5 revisions, as long as you're careful, you take it very seriously, you prepare for war on those cases, prepare for the worst, um, if you have a good a a vascular access surgeon, we've gotten all those patients uh, uh, through. But this reoperation rate is pretty small, you know, compared to what I hear my deformity colleagues talk about taking patients with adult deformity uh, back, you know, 20% or 30% or 40% of the time, and everybody just kind of, you know, shrugs their shoulders and says, that's high, but that's the, the cost of doing business. This is 1%, um, which is 1% more than you want, but it's, it's a pretty low number. Um, we looked at uh, removals and revision. That's the paper that I just told you about. Again, the consecutive series of 1,700. Pretty long follow-up because uh, they were all, we only uh, looked at two years or more um, in follow-up. And these were the, the numbers of patients. They told you 17 uh, removals. Um, and then uh, some of these were multiple levels. So it was really about 2,000 implants. Um, we, what we were able to do looking at this data is look at the timing. Like at what point in each surgeon's um, learning curve or experience did these reoperations occur. About 40% of the anterior uh, secondary surgeries were within um, one month of the index surgery. So most of them, or a large part of them, are early. So they represent technical errors, malpositioning, um, or uh, subsidence in patients who are improperly selected. So part of that can be minimized by just 
preaching you know, and, and telling people the right patient selection and avoiding these kind of errors. 85% occurred within the first two years. So um, late, we, it's pretty rare to see a, a reason for uh, reoperation. And when we looked at each individual surgeon, it was the 40% the of them were in the first 25 that each guy did. So the learning curve is um, uh, relatively steep for a few cases until you and your OR team get used to it and then you know, kind of learn for the rest of your life. So it's not, uh, not horrendous, but um, that is where you can expect to see a little bit more of your errors, but no significant vascular or visceral injuries in all of these reoperations. We were happy to, to see that because the, you know, it's, it's tiger country first time around, and it's like super tiger country uh, second time around. Um, adjacent uh, level degeneration, we talked about that yesterday with uh, cervical spine. We've also looked at it after um, uh, lumbar arthroplasty as well for both uh, ProDisc and the active L. And um, one of the, the neat um, papers that we were able to publish after the five-year data was available was looking at the adjacent level degeneration radiographically because all that uh, the information was down at medical metrics in their computers. So we just tasked their radiologists and said, listen, here's a scoring system. Look at the adjacent level on the pre-op film, skip to the five-year film, and score that pre-op level again. And just tell us whether the, pre -op, the adjacent level from pre-op to five years got worse or not. So it was a very clean study. So here's what we found, and we call it just a delta um, in adjacent level degeneration because it's not going to get better at the adjacent level. It would only get worse. So of the patients who randomized to a 360 fusion, they found worsening of adjacent level degeneration in 28.6%. In the patients who randomized to an artificial disc, it was only in 9.2%. So that's, a, that's greater than three to one difference. That's pretty highly statistically significant. So then we said to them, hey, listen, call out the patients who were pristine at their adjacent level, patients who just had single level disease, who looked like that, where the adjacent level was a zero, what about those patients? What happened to that adjacent level? So you take out the variability of, of a level that was already showing some degeneration, and they did. They said in those patients, if they randomized to a fusion, 23.8% had worsening at five years radiographically, but only 6.7% of the arthroplasty patients. So that difference is still three to one and even more highly statistically significant. So kind of giving pretty good evidence that there is some protective effect, at least radiographically, and we have to follow them over time to see whether that will translate to a difference in reoperation rate and um, other functional disability. Uh, the active L, we did a similar thing. We were able to look at the adjacent level by sending them down to medical metrics. And they kind of reiterated for us that the, um, the change in adjacent level degeneration at the levels above an artificial disc was about 9.7%. So in the same ballpark that we had found uh, in the earlier study. Um, the other thing we're able to do, um, similar to a paper I showed you yesterday with cervical, is for the first time start to cut the onion a little deeper and get more granular and say degree by degree of motion, what, were, what was the adjacent segment degeneration radiographically? So if we, again, if we did a crappy job and we only got one or zero degrees of range of motion, um, then the adjacent level degeneration was pretty high. It was basically a fusion. But for each degree that we were able to give back to that segment measured at year five, there was a linear decrease in adjacent segment degeneration measured you know, by these radiologists just very objectively. So again, adding to the pile of evidence that motion can be protective for adjacent segment. We also looked at age and found out that um, younger people have a much better protective effect. Uh, older people uh, lose some of that effect uh, over time because they're starting out older. Um, there's literature that, again, shows that three to one difference in, um, in adjacent segment degeneration at five years, looking at patients more uh, clinically and radiographically than, than we did with our digital films. Um, we were able to get with a, you know, on my bended knee, I got a small grant from Depew to contact about 70 of our patients for 10-year follow-up just to see what a 10-year data point looked like, and it looks a lot like the uh, five-year, three-year, two-year, so we're in the same ballpark. So this is not the whole big uh, denominator. I'd love to do that, but that's going to take somebody a lot of money. But it's nice to see that 70 patients at 10 years uh, also haven't tailed up. They haven't lost their 
ODI advantage or their VAS advantage. So, you know, the executive summary is, is, is a lot of good data. This is really hard, strong data. It's not just me, not just my institution. Um, this is, you know, nationwide, um, lots of docs and lots of patients showing that um, at five years that the patients are doing well, that the TDR outcomes are at least as good as fusion outcomes, if not uh, better. Um, good published data showing a protective effect on adjacent level disease or degeneration, I'm sorry. Um, and there have been multiple cost studies also that show segment by segment, the only fusion construct that's cheaper than a lumbar disc replacement is a hunk of autologous iliac crest, which nobody uses anymore as structural graft. Any commercial structural implant, segment by segment, it becomes much more, sometimes dramatically more expensive than a lumbar disc replacement. So, uh, you know, good high levels of data, Judge Judy, and uh, the truth and nothing but the truth. Thanks, guys.